Hi, welcome to the Macabre Emporium. Let me get my emotional support cat. Okay. <laughs> to be quiet and keep the kids quiet, since he was getting anxiety and he didn't want to kill children. Gertrude's daughter even got to join in on what they considered fun. Tell us about the giant turtle. Alan never showed up, nor was he ever heard from again beyond that point. Welcome back to Macabre Emporium. We are now on episode 21. Yes, episode 21. We are legally able to drink and now smoke. Legal beagles. And if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Welcome. And all that good jazz or something. Also, if this is your first episode, you're doing it wrong. Go back and start at number one. Do we really want to go back to number one? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the cats are tearing up the shop today, so apologies, no apologies. And it's, it is what it is. Yep. So, what fun things have we done in the last week or so? The last week, well, last week was my first official training week at work in my new position. Mm-hmm. And it's been kicking your ass quite a bit lately. Yeah, it has. <clears throat> Basically, like right after dinner, just like a 15 minute time period where you're just sitting there with me and then you get in your, I'm falling asleep in my recliner position and <laughs> five minutes later, you're sawing logs, sawing logs for the most part. And yeah. uh, I'll call her out on it by telling her good night. She's like, I'm not going to fall asleep. And boom, there it is. Even though I know damn well I'm going to. Yep. I always try to stop the bullshit before it starts. Right. But it never happens. Yeah. But yeah, my my brain has been uh, pretty mush. It's a lot to absorb. My new position. I'm sure. All the things that I have to learn is a lot. Yeah. A lot. So, and then, you know, we procrastinate on a lot of things, too, playing Diablo 4 beta. Mm-hmm. And that's been super fun. I'm yeah. excited for it to actually, like, finally come out, fully come out, so that we can right. buy it and waste our days. <laughs> The one thing that I've liked about it so far is when you pick up uh, some of the magic items that has a plus one or whatever to a skill and it mm -hmm. allows you to try that while you have that piece of armor equipped. Yeah. Because there was some certain skills I kept realizing, like, how the fuck do I even have this? I know I didn't unlock it in mm -hmm. the skill tree. And then I finally realized it when I swapped armor out because some pop-up window I was not paying any attention to yeah. would show up on my screen. Yep. But... And that, and the whole being able to climb up stuff and jump down. and I do like that. That's, I mean, said being just one linear path on Gives the ground it all the depth. time. Yeah. You know. And it looks like the world's much bigger. It's got to be if they're adding mounts mm -hmm. into it at some point. Mm-hmm. So. Yep. I've liked it a lot so far. Yeah, you know, the Blizzard has really made a huge improvements to it. And that's probably why there's such a huge... Um, time space of time in between each one as well mm -hmm. they give them time unlike most studios that like to just pump shit out and then we'll fix it later or add that content as a dlc later on yeah but it's probably also what's made diablo one of the most successful franchises that's ever <clears> been created <throat> in my own opinion you think mm -hmm. even over fallout and or are you talking um just like in general gotcha not like as one of my favorites but like right. An overall, you know, successful franchise. Yeah. So in case you might have missed it last week, Sarah had a special announcement. I Kinda. did. Yep. It's nothing bad. No. Nope. But I'll let her explain it again. <laughs> 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 Gotta love the asthma. Anyways, um, I got a new position at work and I spent all of last week training. All of this week will be spent as training and then I am on my own afterwards. But with that and the um, plethora of information that I'm going to have to absorb in these two short weeks, um, next to all of the courses that I have to take for work, um, I've decided to step away from the month of April. But I won't really be stepping away. David is still going to be doing his stories. And I'm just going to come on and you know, be his sounding board and, you know, do my usual bullshit input yeah. throughout his stories. So I won't, I'll be here, but I won't be here. I will not be doing my own stories. I won't be researching because my time needs to be spent on my courses. So with that said. Yep. So I, you know, 
you can't, if I'm not enough for you for the week or whatever, I'm going to suggest, you know, go visit our friends at Dark Windows Podcast, like I have many times before, as, you know, I always mm -hmm. throw them out there because of the help that we got in our start. Oh, yeah. And there's also a new, trio crime, a new true crime podcast by the name of Danzy True Crime. It's D-A-N-S-I, True Crime. Mm hmm um, reminded me quite a bit of Sarah and I when we first started, you know, starting out doing this whole adventure together. So yes. going to pass it on from Kevin's help with us yep. to them. Yes. So what do you have this week for us? Uh, this week I am doing true crime. Um, she, it's an old case and it's, I feel like it's fairly well known, which kind of goes against what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. But she's so fucked up, I had to do it. No, that's fine, because, you know, maybe I've never heard of it. Her her case really interests Even me. Even though I'm from quoting last week, the hoarder of podcasts, I might not have heard it. <laughs> you are you are the hoarder of podcasts. You're like, here, let's, we're going to shout out Danzy, Danzy, and then I'm like, uh, what is this? Like, oh, it's another <laughs> podcast I found. Okay. Good to know. Well, I get a lot of time at work to be able to listen to podcasts. That's yeah. how I find this stuff. Lucky you. <laughs> I don't get no time at work. <laughs> Even though it might take me an eight-hour shift to listen to an hour and a half version of the Anita Cult that they just did on Dark Windows. Oh. That's a whole other bonkers group right there. The Dark Windows folks? You know, that plus the Anita Cult, yeah. Oh. The Anita Sex Cult. But... Oh, it's a sex cult. Yep, yeah, and they make silverware. Yeah, you ever seen the brain of Nita Silverware? Yeah, that was started by a sex cult. Nope, never. Silverware ruined for everybody now. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, anyways. But anyhow. What are you talking about? I have another kind of weird history. This is like on the same level as the ban on sliced bread that I did earlier mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. This is the Great Dumpling War of Munich. Yeah, that's all the information he gave me last night. He's like... To be fair, it's only the information she wanted. True. The title enough told me that it was going to be fucking stupid. And not stupid in like a bad way, but stupid in like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, because some of these stories, the way I just picked them is like I scroll through a list and I see that and then I like, okay, that's the one. That's that's the winner. The yeah. fucking dumpling or Yeah. Yeah. So, are you ready to get started then? I is. All right then, let's get going. Mary Bell was born on May 26th in 1957 in Corbridge, Northumberland, England. She was born to a then 17 year old by the name of Elizabeth Bell, but she went by the nickname Betty. So that is what I will reference her as throughout this, is Betty. Betty became a well-known prostitute in the area that they lived. And with the nightlife being her calling, she was not often home. But when she was, she was asleep. Her line of work forced her to travel often. I was not aware that there were traveling prostitutes, but okay. I mean, technically, aren't all prostitutes traveling prostitutes? Well, I mean, yeah. Because when you pick them up <laughs> in one spot and then they go elsewhere... They traveled! Yeah, but, I mean, this isn't like she herself would go out to where the people were. Right. It's, I don't know. <clears throat> Prostitute city! Uh, yeah, so she traveled often, usually to Glasgow, um, which caused her to leave Mary and her sister, either alone or with their father. However, nobody knew who Mary's real father was. Okay. Uh, Mary grew up thinking that her biological dad was a man named Billy Bell, um, and he was he was a gem. Not a gem. Um, like a gem as like a, le a peach. A he was a pop gem. He was a peach. Nah. Uh, and by that I mean violent, alcoholic, um, a severe criminal history, arrest history. He he was he was awesome. Um, he was known best for, like, armed robbery was one thing that he was repeatedly put in, in jail for. Yeah. Unfortunately, Mary never knew for sure if Billy was her father. Um, 
since she was a baby when her mom married him and without a paternity test, it literally could have been anybody because, you know, mom was a prostitute. Right. Yeah. Mary wound up spending her, well, most of her childhood being neglected and wanted and unwanted by her parents. Um, I don't know how to say her name. I, it's Isa. Is it Isa? Uh, it's we'll say it Isa. Isa McCricket, Mary's aunt, said that when Mary was born that her mother had immediately rejected her. Betty had been really pissed at the nurses that they actually tried to place a newborn Mary into her arms after birth. And she got loud with them and shouted, take the thing away from me. Yeah. As Mary grew from baby to toddler to young girl, she repeated, she repeatedly suffered injuries within the home that Betty would claim to be accidents that only happened while she was there alone with her. It was fairly easy to realize that Betty was the one causing all the harm to Mary. Whether it was on accident or on purpose, there were some that even speculated that at times she was actually trying to kill Mary. One incident in 1960, Betty dropped Mary from a first floor window, you know, on accident. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's totally <laughs> on accident there. Okay. <laughs> on another occasion, she basically force fed, force fed Mary a bunch of sleeping pills. She had also sold Mary at one point to a mentally frail lady who wasn't able to have her own kids. Betty's older sister, Catherine, had actually traveled by herself across Newcastle to get Mary and bring her back to Betty's house. Even with Betty's neglect and abuse towards Mary, she was nice enough to turn down multiple offers from her family members that wanted to take Mary in and take care of her. I say nice, but she wasn't. She was a bitch. She began working as a dominic... A she began working as a dominatrix and was starting to bring clients of hers back home and um, allowed and encouraged even for them to sexually abuse Mary in sadomasochistic rituals. And Mary was what age at this time? She was little. This was the 1960s, like early 1960s, and she was born in 57. No. Oh. So she was little. So with Mary... <clears throat> Um, with everything that she had gone through, she started to show, like, temperamental signs, basically. While at school and home, Mary had showed a tremendous amount of signs. Tremendous amount. Um, most, of which were disturb most of which were disturbing and unpredictable behaviors. This included mood swings to chronic bedwetting. She had been known to fight other kids, and that's boys and girls. Didn't matter to her. Yeah. Um, while she was at school. Everyone's going to catch these hands. <laughs> yep. Um, on more than one occasion, she attempted to suffocate and or strangle her classmates. She at one point attempted to block another girl's trachea by filling her mouth and throat with sand. Like, low Mary, Mary Bell was fucking psycho. Uh, with these behaviors, as you can imagine, not many people wanted to be around her, be her friend, play with her, nothing. Uh, Mary often spent her time with Norma Bell, Norma Joyce Bell, which was no relation to Mary. They just happened to have the same last name. Okay. Norma was 13 and the daughter of one of the next door neighbors. One of Mary's classmates said that by 1968, she and the rest of the classmates had gotten used to Mary and how she behaved. Eh, it's frightening. Yeah, you tell that the, the one that had the fucking sand shoved down her fucking throat. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's something you get used to. Um, however, they knew something else was going on when Mary would start shaking her head and having her eyes just like basically glaze over. Like she's staring at you. There's nothing behind. No. There, she ain't there. Um, in the first account of this happening, Mary's peers knew that she was about to go ballistic and turn violent. Um, and Mary, when she had that like dead stare, mm -hmm. she was pinpoint locked into who she was going to attack. Saturday, May 11th, 1968, there was a three-year-old boy found wandering around the house, <laughs> found wandering around and bleeding. He was dazed, but he was able to tell police that he had been playing with Mary Bell and her friend Norma. He said they were all playing on top of an unused air raid shelter 
Have you ever seen one of those? No, I, I understand what an air raid shelter is, but <clears throat> okay. From what this would be from is probably like pre, well, not pre World War Two, post World War Two more than mm-hmm. likely, and then just they just left it. Yep. Um, he said they were playing on top of the air raid shelter when he was pushed off of the roof and fell seven feet to the ground. This caused a really bad cut to his head, and he claimed he hadn't known exactly who pushed him off out of the two girls that were present. But we'll get there. (laughs) That very same day, a set of parents got a hold of the police to make complaints that both Mary and Norma had tried strangling their three children while they played together in their sandbox. That same evening, both Mary and Norma were interviewed by police. Both girls said they didn't push the boy from the roof. Instead, they claimed they walked by, saw the boy laying there, and bleeding from his head. So basically they're saying they walked up on it, walked up on him after he had already fallen. Mm-hmm. Sure, okay. <laughs> when questioned about the three girls that claimed that the two of them had tried to strangle them, Mary played dumb, said she didn't do it. Norma, though, she settled straight away and uh, let them know that Mary had tried to throttle each one of them. That was her word she used, was throttle. Yeah. Norma told police, and this was a direct quote from Norma, Mary went to one of the girls and said, what happens if you choke someone? Do they die? Then Mary put both hands around the girl's throats and squeezed. That girl started to go purple. I told Mary to stop, but she wouldn't, and then she put her hands around Pauline's throat, and she started going purple as well. Another girl, Susan Cornish, came up, and Mary did the same thing to her. Police then notified the local authorities. Uh, Police then notified the local authorities of what had taken place and of the extreme violent nature of Mary alone. However, the girls were young and due to their age, they were given a warning and let go. Of course. No other action was taken against them. So, 14 days later, May 25th, 1968... This was the day before Mary's 11th birthday. This would be the day Mary kills her first victim. She strangled a four-year-old boy named Martin Brown. She killed him in the upstairs of, like, a defunct house. Like, it was basically shambles at that point. Yeah. It's believed that Mary committed the murder by herself... Martin's body was found by three kids around 3.30 p.m. that day. He had been laying on his back with his arms above his head. There were no visible marks of violence on his body at all, except for um, blood specks on his face and foam around his mouth. A local man, John Hall, arrived on the scene soon after the children had found his body and attempted to do CPR on Martin, there was no point. Like, he was he was already gone. Right. While John attempted CPR, two girls, 10-year-old Mary and her 13-year-old friend Norma, happened to appear in the doorway of the bedroom where Martin lay dead. John, oh, that's such a coincidence. Yeah. John was quick to kick them out of the house. They left and went straight to Rita Finley's house. So Rita was Martin's aunt, and they told her, one of your sister's bairns, which means kids if you didn't know that word, okay. uh, just had an accident. We think it's Martin, but we can't tell because there's blood all over him. But there wasn't. It was just specks on his face. Yeah. The next day, Dr. Bernard Knight performed an autopsy on Martin. Bernard was not able to find any signs of physical violence on his body, which made it really hard to de- determined the actual cause of death. He was able to toss away the opinions of the investigators that the child had died from ingesting poison tablets. Um, The day that Mary turned 11, May 28th, both she and Norma broke into and destroyed a nearby nursery. They were able to get inside by peeling tiles off of the roof. Um, While they were having field day inside, they did everything from rip up books to overturn desks. Um, They broke ink pens and smeared the ink all over the walls. They painted all over the walls. Just anything they could destroy on that property, they did. 
The next day, staff discovered that they had been vandalized. The police were notified and they came to investigate. While there, the police found four notes. And I'm just going to say this now. This will be in the written portion on our website. These are written like the spellings all awful. Punctuation, capitalization, it's awful. She was 11. All right. But I put it in here the exact way that she wrote them. So, one of the notes said, I murder so that I may come back. Don't know what that means. The second one said, we did murder Martin Brown, but spelled it Martin, M-A-R-T-A-I-N. Fuck off, F-U-C-K-O-F, one word, you bastard. <laughs> like, just very childish the way this is written. The third said, fuck off, we murder, but it was spelled F-U-C-H, watch out, Fanny and faggot. Don't know. The last note read, You are mice. Why? Because we murdered Martin. Go brown. You bet look out there. Our murders about by Fanny and old faggot you screws. This is like Britain English. Right. So you decipher out of that what you want to decipher, but the way that it's written is awful. Two days after that, on May, May 29th, Mary and Norma were playing a game of chicken. They both had called the house of Martin's mother, June. Knowing that his funeral was soon, and asked if they could see her son. June responded by saying that um, they couldn't see her son because her son was dead. Mary replied, oh, I know he's dead. I want to see him in his coffin. Like This little girl is nuts. Yeah, well, with the traumatic experience <clears throat> she had when she was younger, it can be. Yeah, it's like people yeah. want to talk bad about those baby boxes that have been installed at uh-huh. fire stations all over. I mean, it's like if one of these baby boxes were available in this time period, would we even be sitting here talking mm-hmm. about her? You, you never know, because a lot of things you're born with and not. Right, I understand that. You know. But I'm sure the traumatic experiences helped accelerate some of her issues. Oh, definitely. Definitely. But what I'm saying is, is like, if the baby boxes we have now were available for the being anonymous to drop mm-hmm. them off, if she was dropped off in one of these boxes, if she, like we would even be still sitting here talking about her, but in a lesser way or even at all. Right. Nope, I get you. Definitely would have given her a better childhood. Yeah. So Brian Howe would become victim number two on July 31st, 1968. Brian was three years old when he was last seen by his parents. He had been playing in the street with one of his other siblings, the family dog, and you guessed it, Mary and Norma. When the parents realized that he hadn't returned home, a lot of people, like, immediately took off searching because of what happened to Martin. Um... There were relatives that showed up to search. Neighbors had begun to search. No one could find him. A little after 11 p.m., a search party did find him. And his body had been, um, like, between two very large bricks of cement. Okay. The police arrived on scene and saw that there had been a... The police arrived on scene and saw that there had been an attempt to hide his body. It was covered in clumps of weeds and grass, just pulled right there out of the ground. His lips were blue. He had several scratches and bruises around his neck. And there was a lone pair of broken scissors laying next to his feet. The coroner made the assessments and gave Brian's cause of death a strangulation. They went on to say that Brian had been dead for up to eight hours prior to his body being found by the search party. So he was... He, there was no attempt at CPR or anything on him. Whoever killed him had squeezed Brian's nostrils closed with one hand while gripping his throat with the other. There were a lot of puncture wounds on his legs, um, which they determined happened before he died. There were patches of his hair cut off his head, his genitals had been mutilated, and there was a badly carved M in his stomach. 
with the pretty small amount of force that was used to murder Brian, Mm -hmm. because he was only three, didn't take a lot of force. Um, The coroner came to the conclusion that whoever killed Brian was also a child. So this is the third victim of hers? There's only two. Oh, the second one? The first one was Martin, and then the second, Brian. Because it's like... I thought for some reason there was a third one that I just wasn't remembering. Nope. It's like, how is nobody putting a correlation between these two and these kids disappearing? And everyone's like, don't you get near them, two girls. Nope. So there was Martin's murder and right. then the shit that they did in between by vandalizing the nursery. Right. And then Brian. So yeah, for some reason, probably it's like plugging the nursery as a murder itself for some nope. stupid reason other than somebody's patience on having to clean that up. Yeah. When Brian was discovered, it sparked a fairly large manhunt for the killer. There were over 100 detectives assigned to the case. A hundred. There were more than 1,200 kids that were questioned about what they were doing on the day of Brian's death. Two of those children questioned were none other than... You forgot their names already? Yes, I did. Mary, <laughs> Mary and something else. Mary and Norma. Witnesses had said that the two were seen playing with Brian earlier that day. In Norma's first interview, she seemed extremely nervous. Um, Mary was the complete opposite. She was cool, calm, collected, like... Any other serial killer. Yep. Both girls did a lot of beating around the bush during their questioning. Um, But after a while, they both admitted to playing with Brian on that day. However... They added that he wasn't seen by them um, after lunchtime. Okay. Mary was questioned again the next day, and she said she had remembered seeing a local boy playing with Brian on the day he died. She said she saw this boy hit Brian and remembered that the boy was covered in grass and weeds. Also, she remembered that he had scissors. Mary said, and this is another quote, I saw him trying to cut a cat's tail off with the scissors, but there was something wrong with them. One leg was broken or bent. Detective James Dobson thought that sounded extremely Um, self-incriminating. And it convinced him that Mary Bell had to be Brian's killer. Since only the police knew that the pair of scissors was broken. Right. Oh, that's weird. You know, that British fucking police work is a lot better than American police work. You know, <laughs> Back in the 60s at, right, at cause, that. Right, because, you know, back in the 60s in the United States, well, more so the 70s with all the serial killers that had an uprising then, mm-hmm. it's just like, eh, okay, whatever. Yeah. And then there's these guys. But, you know, yep. Sherlock Holmes probably took a huge, like, part of that. Probably. It's like, I just want to be like Sherlock Holmes and Watson. I'm going to join the police force. <laughs> right? I'm actually going to do my job thoroughly. Um, when detectives looked into the boy Mary had spoken about that had been seen seen um, hitting Brian, um, it, it was found out pretty quickly that he was at Newcastle International Airport with his family that day, and there were multiple witnesses that could corroborate the story that his parents had told about him being there. Right, so, there you go, you dumb fucks. Let's try and pin a murder on somebody that has a very solid alibi. Cr- well, idiots. when you're young and dumb. Eh, true, but still. Right. August 4th, 1968, Norma Bell's parents contacted the police, stating that Norma wanted to confess. Confess to what, though? Well, she confessed to seeing Brian's dead body. She said Mary had taken her to a spot and showed her Brian's body. Norma said that Mary gave her a visual visualization of how she had strangled him and said that Mary confessed that she actually enjoyed strangling Brian before she told of how she used the scissors and a razor blade to leave scour marks on Brian's body. Norma was able to lead police directly to the spot where Brian's dead body had laid. Norma was also able to draw a picture for the police to show them, um how she remembered the wound on Brian's stomach. Guess what? It matched the description the coroner had given of that M carved into his stomach. Right. Investigators went to Mary's house early in the morning the next day, and this time, instead of being cool, calm, and collected, 
Mary was extremely defensive. She kept saying that the investigators were trying to brainwash her. Brainwash her how? Dunno. Later in the day, Norma was questioned again, and she admitted to investigators that she had been there when Brian was strangled. She said the three of them were there alone, and, this quote, Mary seemed to go all funny. She said Mary pushed Brian into the grass and started strangling him before turning to Norma and saying, my hands are getting thick, take over. And this is when Norma ran from the scene and left little Brian there with no. psychopath Mary. On August 7th, 1968, Brian Howe was laid to rest with over 200 mourners in attendance. Well, all but one. Investigator Dobson was planning to arrest both girls that night. However, Mary made it easy for him because as the boy was in his coffin was bring, being brought out of his home to start the funeral processions, Mary was there. She had stood outside of the house laughing hysterically and clapping. And at this point, Dobson knew that he had, he had to get the girl. Right. Both Mary and her friend Norma were arrested and charged with the murder of Brian at 8 p.m. that night. When Mary heard the charge, her response was, That's all right by me. Norma cried out, I never, I'll pay you back for this, which she was aiming at uh, Mary. With a witness on hand, Mary wrote a statement admitting that she had been present when when Brian was murdered, but she chose to blame Norma for it. Mary admitted that they were both responsible for the vandalism at the nursery the day after killing Martin Brown and also admitted to writing the four notes that the detective had found. After the girls were arrested, they were both given psychological evaluations and the results from those tests uh, told them pretty much what they already knew. Very bad shit crazy. <laughs> Norma was a tad intellectually slow and extremely submissive and showed her emotion easily. Mary, on the other hand, uh, was cunning, prone to mood swings. She would be willing to talk to you, and then she would clam up and immediately get defensive. Like two polar opposite kids. Yeah. The psychiatrist that examined Mary concluded that she was not suffering from a mental disorder. She was suffering from a psychopathic personality disorder. Which I feel like is a mental disorder. Yeah. In an official report, Dr. David Westbury stated, Mary's social techniques are primitive and take the form of automatic denial, ingratiation, which I had to look up because I did not know what that meant. Um, Basically, ingratiation is um, putting on an act to make yourself more likable. Um, That's pretty much what it is. Yeah. So even if you're not a likable person, you put that face on and you act that part to get what you want, basically. Okay. She also used manipulation, complaining, and bullying often. Um, And she had what they would call flight of violence, where basically she'd black Mm -hmm. out and, you know... Violence was the next thing on on the agenda for her. Mary Bell and Norma Bell went on trial for the murders of Brian Howe and Martin Brown on December 5th, 1968. So this all of this shit happened within like a year. Okay. A lot of it very close together. Um, both girls pled not guilty to the charges that were given to them. Of course. <laughs> on the first day of the trial, the judge waived the defendant's right to anonymity solely because of their ages. Their names, ages, and pictures were released to the media. And, of course, the media took them and released them to the world um, with the judge's permission. It showed the girls sitting next to their defenders, police officers, and family. The case opened with a six-hour opening statement where the jury was told that they had a long, unpleasant, and distressing task ahead of them. It stated that there would be many similarities between the two murders and that they had plenty of evidence to prove the guilt of the young girls. In the span of six hours, the girls' ages came out. It was stated that Norma was older, but we knew that already. Right. Um, 
It also stated that Mary was the dominant one out of the two. Clearly. It was said both girls were equally capable of killing both of the little boys and that it was done solely for the pleasure and excitement of murder and that both girls knew what they were doing and they knew that it was wrong. Um, and they also did it knowing that there would be consequences. Right. On day five of the trial, Normal was on the stand. She said she didn't have anything to do with the actual murders, but admitting to talking to Mary about attacking and killing small children. She said she, she said that she had no physical role in the murders um, because she never touched the children. Mm-hmm. Norma's parents took to the stand and claimed that while Mary was over one day, they caught her trying to strangle Norma's little sister and that it took Norma's dad punching Mary in the shoulder to get her to, get her to stop. Ian Fraser, a child psychologist, testified that Mary's mental age was that of an eight-year-old and she was 11 at this time. So not truly that delayed. Yeah. She would still know right from wrong at that point. Um... He said that she had a more limited capacity to know right from wrong, but it wasn't impossible. He said that she had um, the ability to appreciate the criminal acts that she had committed. She enjoyed doing what she did. Yeah. It wasn't Ted Bundy the same way, too? I believe so. On December 17th, 1968, the jury came to a decision in three hours and 25 minutes. Norma was acquitted of all charges against her, and when she heard that, she started clapping and crying in, like, not excitement, but relief. Mary Bell was not charged with murder, but instead manslaughter of both Brian and Martin. The judge was pretty precise when he described Mary as a dangerous individual that posed a very grave risk to other children. No, oh, you don't say. <laughs> He deemed that steps needed to be taken to protect the public from Mary. She would then be sentenced to be imprisoned indefinitely. When Mary heard her charges, she cried, as did her good-for-nothing mother and grandmother. Yeah, good lord. When Mary was charged and detained, she was 11 and a half years old. She was, and still is, Britain's youngest female killer. Is she still alive today? I'll get to that. Okay. And there we go, jumping ahead again. <clears throat> you do that a lot. Mary was initially held in Durham Remand Home, but was later transferred to South Norwood. Then again, transferred in 1969, this time to the Red Bank Secure Unit, which was a young offenders institution. She was the only female among the 24 inmates that were currently being held. Mary would accuse one of the members of staff and numerous inmates of sexually abusing her, which I don't doubt. Her being the only female out of 24 people. Yeah. Like, I, I don't doubt that. She claimed the abuse started when she was 13. At the age of 16, in November of 1973, she was transferred again to Moore Court Open Prison. While there, she took a course to learn how to become a secretary. In 1977, Mary and another female inmate escaped the prison and had a few days out with a couple of boys that they met. They had fun, they went to amusement parks and slept in hotels before the two inmates went their separate ways. She was caught and arrested again at one of the guy's homes that she had met and hung out with on September 13th. She had dyed her hair blonde and changed her name to Mary Robinson in hopes that it would disguise her enough that she could stay out. You know? Well, yeah, maybe if you didn't choose the first name of fucking Mary. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately that plan failed miserably. Uh, she was taken back into custody that night and Mary's punishment for fleeing was 28 days of no prison privileges. And I don't know what privilege you get in prison, that would make 28 days of no prison privileges a fucking punishment. Well, if you're going to think, like, no visitation, no phone calls. I guess. Um, books from the prison library. <clears throat> anything that can be seen as a privilege. Tele- TV time, outdoor time, unless it's, like, mandated. I'm not sh- sure. Uh, maybe. Um, so, like, basically, they're putting her in solitary confinement for the most part. I, I understand That's that. That's what I would... See that as uh, I mean, you, you could be right. 
I don't really see those as privileges when you're in fucking prison, but okay. Right. Well, even when they're in prison, you know, showing the good behavior, you know, <clears throat> they reward right. them or whatever to. Right. It's part of the reform process, I guess you could say. Um, the classes that she's taking, that could be considered a privilege as well, too. Wow, well, maybe. Well, yeah. Which is kind of fucking pointless when you're present in life in prison. Why are you taking secretary classes? But anyhow. Word. Mary was released from prison. What? In oh, May- I spoke too fucking soon. <laughs> That's fucking bullshit. In May of 1980, when she was 23 years old, she had served 11 years in prison. The courts granted her anonymity, which allowed her to start her life over anywhere within the country that she wanted to. So she had to stay in in England. Um, but when she was released, she asked a spokeswoman to speak for her so that her face grown up wouldn't be on on camera Mm -hmm. um and to tell the press that she wished to be given a chance to live a normal life and to be left alone no fuck that you killed two children you don't get that privilege you shouldn't even have a spokesperson to stay anonymous correct in may of 1980 four years after her release mary gave birth to a baby girl this baby would be her only child as far as we know growing up the daughter knew nothing of her mother's history until 1998, when reporters found Mary in a resort town where they had been living. With her being found by the reporters, no less, that forced her to come clean to her daughter and then relocate. She had no choice but to tell her daughter that she was a child killer who killed two children. I couldn't even imagine that thing happening. It's like, no. you know, some of the other shows, they joke about Dad Watch being, you know, of the same thing, but... Like, actually, it being an actual thing, it's just like, oh, uh-huh. what? Yeah. I hear my other real mother calling me. <laughs> the other mother. <laughs> yeah, the other mother from Coraline's calling yep. me. Yep. Mary had been outed as having returned to her childhood home. Well, her childhood town. And had even lived there again for a little while, which I find very fucked up. And it's kind of ballsy that there's people that are still living there. Correct. Mary Bell's current location is unknown, though it is known that she is still alive. And her um, location will forever remain protected by the high court order of anonymity. So nobody will ever be able to out out her for being Mary Bell. Unless somebody knows the story and hears about it. Right. To this day, Mary has never claimed that she was wrongly convicted of the murders and says that the abuse that she endured as a child will never excuse her crimes. No shit, you fucking psycho. Right. That's it. Yeah. Strange case, huh? Yeah, it's a little strange. I mean, I wouldn't. That's not exactly what I expected. How did this thing really go either? <laughs> what were you expecting? I'm not. Oh, fuck him that. <laughs> my like perfect timing for me going on rant about being fucking released and shit and. <laughs> Yeah, you like to skip ahead, and sometimes at the best opportunity. Yeah, because was, literally the next sentence was it's like, "It's never on the will." I guess you could say that, you know. I guess divine, so. See, the divine intervention has like made it for a comedic <clears throat> moment. Yep. Um, something I did think about with it sitting there uh-huh. listening to the story, I never really explained about what baby boxes are because we do have a few That's international true. listeners that don't have them maybe or they call them something else Mm -hmm. Um, but baby boxes are they've been starting to be installed in fire and police stations and other secure locations here in the united states that if you feel like you're an unfit parent you can drop your child off in one of these baby boxes it would be completely anonymous once the door shut an alarm goes off inside to alert those inside the building it's usually, like I said, it's generally like a police or fire station because they're manned 24 hours a day. Mm-hmm. There's an alarm that goes off. They're temperature controlled, so they're not exposed to the elements or anything. So, and they've actually been used quite a bit. So, and I don't know the exact numbers of how many children have been saved by these, yeah. but it's like, what would have happened if Mary <clears throat> really would have gotten in one of these boxes? If they were around in the 60s. Well, she wouldn't have had to deal with a lot of the home shit that she had to deal with. Right. Which, I mean, would would definitely have played a part in growing up psychopath. You right. Know? And killing two children. Right. 
I mean, it, you were, you're right. It could have completely, the story would never have been made probably. Right. Because, you know, it would have, she would have gone to, through an adoption ag- agency, been placed with people that sincerely want children. Right. And could give her, you know, the life that she deserved. Yep. Yeah. And she was so cute, Mary, when she was little. Yeah. She was so cute. It's always those quiet ones you gotta watch out for, they say. Yeah. Well, she technically wasn't too quiet. She was very cute, though. I would say that's probably one hell of a send-off, I guess, you could give yourself for your month break here. Yeah. But I owe a lot of that to Wikipedia. Like, it was just laid out so well right. that I, I mean, used sometimes it. Sometimes that's... The Tossed. best source of information, unfortunately, and then sometimes it's completely wrong on some <clears throat> things that I've gone over. But I did compare it to other right it's the best pages, thing you can really and do. yeah, it was very similar. So, you ready to hear about the Great Dumpling War? Of Fuck Germany? yeah, I've been ready since last night when you said <laughs> the Great Dumpling War. <laughs> All right then. Almost every neighborhood has an angry old man of sorts. Typically, they just want you to stay off their lawn and keep to the sidewalks as they take pride in how well manicured their lawns are. They could yell at you from the rocking chair on the front porch or turning their garden hose on you to drive the point home to stay off their lawn. But what if it wasn't you that they found so annoying and disturbing their peace? For a man in the passing district of Munich, Germany, his annoyance was a much greater force. And that force was known as the United States and German militaries. Mm-hmm. Would you just ignore this issue, or would you try and wage war against two of the most powerful armies on the planet? I'd ignore it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, not armies, air forces, I mean. Right. Again, I would ignore it. (laughs) Helmut G. Winter worked from home as a commercial artist in Munich, West Germany during the Cold War. Sounds great to be able to work from home, right? Well, Helmut's problem was that his home was over the flight path of... The Schleswig-Holm Air Base, outside of German of Munich, Germany. Mm-hmm. Helmut, thunder! <laughs> I heard that. I don't know if you guys heard that or not. There's a storm rolling in or not. So who knows? Maybe you might charge some of the spooky stuff here in the store. Ooh! Salem might start losing his shit and be yeah. up all night. Our specter chaser. Yeah. Anyhow, Helmut would become fed up with the constant buzzing from German to United States aircraft. With his experience as an artillery observer in the war times, he estimated that these planes from the airbase were flying as low as 450 feet and helicopters under 150 feet. And that's really low. Yeah. Okay. Helmut also expressed, um, Helmut, also Helmut, or Helmut, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure it's Helmut. Helmut estimated that approximately up to 100 flights a day would buzz his house. Helmut. Winters would say, these pli- pilots are flying so low, I can see their faces. Damn. Well, at 150 feet, I'm sure you can in a helicopter, even though they fly at a much slower pace than mm-hmm. jet fighters do. Yeah. If that was even the case. <clears throat> Initially, Helmut would try a more formal approach for both militaries and send letters of complaints about these planes flying too low, but with no responses at first, he finally decided to take matters into his own hands to get their attention. On February 4th, 1967, while putting on the finishing touches of one of his drawings that he was doing for his work, a F-104 starfighter would break the sound barrier over Helmut's home. Now, being the Air Force at air shows, you've kind of heard that. That would be terrifying. Well, the jets that we've seen at Freedom Fest near us and when you see the white Miss yeah. coming off, that's them breaking the sound barrier. Mm-hmm. So you've heard that happen mm-hmm. personally, so you know what it's like. Yeah. Um, them breaking the sound barrier would shake his house, and this would cause his drawing that he was just finishing up to be ruined from the ink that was using by spilling and it smearing across his drawing. Oh, damn. probably from him jumping out of yeah. fright from the sound barrier being broken yeah because that shit's loud yeah. and to have it that low above right above your house the mm-hmm. uh, that'd be so loud yeah this was the final straw for him in a fit of rage he would place an ad in a local newspaper for anti-aircraft gun with sufficient ammunition wanted to restore peace and order in the airspace of munich <laughs> helmet would state he took out the ad in an emotional state and he actually didn't mean what was said in his ad that he had placed in the newspaper uh-huh 
but he would get the attention from the British Broadcasting Company, the American press, and even the Secret Service. I bet. Even though being upset from his ruined drawing when he placed his ad, he did get some responses to his ad, and he would get some offers. Oh, God. A complete quad barrel, Firelings flak anti-air gun with 5,000 rounds of ammunition, a 15-centimeter flak gun from the Izar section of town, with a request for two winters to also cleanse the eastern section of Munich skies from the, um, the Amis, which is a German slang term for Americans. Hmm. And surface to air missiles that were in private hands. Oh. With this being during the Cold War, everybody had, you know, weapons because of mm-hmm. the huge threat in between. But I don't really know a lot about Cold War history. So, no, no, that makes sense now because, you know, East and West Germanys were different political forces at the time. So, yep. that's why we would be allied with them on one side and not the other. Right. But going on, because that could be a whole other topic. It would only be a few nights later that when the British Broadcasting Company was wanting interviews with winners, American journalists would also show up wanting in t- wanting to know everything about the imminent shooting down of the jet fighters. With all the attention he was getting from his, his place to advertisements, men in trench coats, as, you know, in quotations, uh-huh. in case you can't see it, started to hang around Helmut's winter's home. He believes that these men in trench coats were from the Secret Service said to keep eyes on him to see if he really did have any of these weapons, considering his ad that he had been that he had taken out in the newspaper could be considered an act of war, and any threat like this during the Cold War was taken very seriously. Oh, I'm sure. Even though Helmut was a veteran of the Russian campaign of World War II, he was a peaceful man and didn't want to actually hurt anyone, but he knew he had to shoot something, but it mustn't be warlike. So he would then enlist the help of a local cabinet maker and his wife, Elizabeth, to make a crossbow and potato dumplings, a staple food in Bavaria, and it would be known, also known in their area known as Kartoffing Noodle. Kartoffing Noodle? Yes. <laughs> I had to put in a pronunciation guide in here for me to understand how to say it correctly. <laughs> Kartoffing Noodle. Yeah. Uh, sorry about the background noise. There's a storm coming in, so I mean... Yep. Who knows? You're going to hear some rains and some some thunders. So who knows? Maybe it might charge some of the more haunted objects on the Emporium shells. Ooh, Ooh it's pretty. Maybe pick up some more EVPs like we did with Oscar. Could, well, could be. It's if I want to sit and listen to Dead Space. <laughs> right. right. So if you have, have ever watched the slightest bit of The Walking Dead or any zombie related thing or mm-hmm. anything in medieval times, you know what a crossbow is, what it looks like. Some sources call it a crossbow. Some call it a catapult. For the sake of me being able to read, I'm just going to call it a catapult. Okay. If I accidentally switch back back to it, oh well. Because it looked like it was a combination of both, really. Right. But for those that aren't so handy in the kitchen and aren't sure what dumplings are, they are usually small pieces of dough made from flour, water, and salt. But this is Germany's, so they would be more potato dumplings that consist of potatoes, eggs, cornstarch, and generally parsley in the um, one recipe the article had posted for people to be out of curious how to make potato dumplings. Uh-huh. For approximately 10 days, Helmut Winters would lob potato dumplings at aircraft flying over his house. <laughs> Even though it only had a range of about 200 feet, it was still enough to get the attention of pilots and make them veer off course. There is a short film on Reuters.com of Winters d- demonstrating what he would do with his crossbow or catapult, mm-hmm. along with his pet wiener dog retrieving the dumplings. This would be broadcasted in 70, 72 different countries. Oh, my goodness. So Later it was on. like a big thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is such a unique thing that's going on. And the world's got to know about it, apparently, I yeah. guess you could say. People of Munich and surrounding towns would refer to Winters as the Robin Hood of Munich. A lone <laughs> man and a dedicated dumpling cooking wife fighting for the sanity and peace of the entire city of Munich and the surrounding little towns. It is also said that people ate dumplings in the honor of the fighting spirit that Helmut Winters had. Huh. It has been estimated also that he would shoot up to 120 potato dumplings a week, any week, at German and American airplanes. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> now you said that he could shoot them 200 feet in the air. Yes. So he definitely could have hit the helicopters if they were only right. flying at 150. Oh, we'll get into that here. Oh, look at me jumping the gun. Yeah, look okay. at you. Perfect timing on that. <laughs> 
He would keep up his barrage of dumplings until both Germany and the United States would finally surrender to Winters. Even though Germany wouldn't have an official surrendering to Helmut Winters and simply just fly their planes at a higher altitude. Unlike the United States Air Force, Major Donald Murphy, the commander of the air base, would have a more formal and invite informal surrender and invite him and his wife for an unconditional surrender to Helmut. With a basket full of dumplings, the crossbow slash catapult loaded into the trunk of his car, and with her faithful dog Shotzi, drove on to the air base to meet with the Major. Major Murphy and Winters would end up meeting in the cockpit of a helicopter that had what appears to be a dumpling-sized dent in its fuselage. <laughs> Winters would claim he never hit any of the aircraft, and as the Major jokingly took a dumpling from the basket, he placed it in the dent, which coincidentally fit perfect. Oh my god, so he did hit one! No, you don't know if we did or not. They never said if I could find out if he did or not, but... He did. I don't know. What are the odds of there being a dent fit? You know, the, one of these perfectly baseball, shaped for a dumpling, which were like in the video that I mentioned it, they look like to be about baseball size. Yeah, god possibly. damn, those are some big ass dumplings. Well, you know, I'm gonna show you the video before we leave the shop okay. today so you can see this. Major Murphy would present Helmut Winters and his wife with a document of unconditional surrender stating the United States Air Force would henceforth fly no lower than 1500 feet when flying over Munich and the surrounding suburbs. suburbs. Pleased with his win of the Great Dumpling War, he donated his crossbow, crossbow and a basket of dumplings to the United States Air Force. The Major would invite Helmut and his wife to a peace dinner of southern fried chicken and dumplings. Helmut would be known as a dumpling snob to his family, and he would tell the Major, American dumplings are too wet and too soggy for shooting at airplanes, <laughs> only good for smearing <laughs> windshields. Oh. The New York Times, New York uh, Newsweek, San Francisco Chronicle, and many other newspapers would report on the front page, Dumpling Attack routes, reroutes the Luftwaffe, which Luf-a-fa. was the, the, what the German Air Force is known as. Oh, okay. Helmut Winter was a local folk hero and would be a, the first recipient of the Carl Valentine Prize for using humor to solve a public policy problem. Carl Valentine was a well-known comic of the region that lived from 1882 to 1948. Huh. He's just basically a German comedian for mm-hmm. things like Charlie Chaplin for the okay. most part. He would go on to create the Dumpling Order, which I f- tried to find out more on what this was, but all I could find was a few pictures that came up was with Helmut with miniature versions of his crossbow slash catapult, which he would hand out until his death in 2013. Some of the recipients of this award were small school children that built their own catapult similar to his, a mural <laughs> artist, and the Passinger Archives, which is like the historical society for the area. Okay. And if there are a few articles that did talk about it. It was no English translation from Google, oh. unfortunately. And I don't know anybody that speaks German or can read German that can, mm-hmm. would have been able to find, you know, find out what the dumpling order was for me, unfortunately. There would even be a pop song written about him. And the only thing I could find out of it was there one line would go as, I am the dumpling shooter from Bavaria because I'm a friend of peace and quiet. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I'd like, I tried Googling it. <clears throat> it doesn't come Couldn't up anywhere. It. No, Damn. not even Spotify. didn't have anything about it. I figure if Spotify doesn't have it, I can't, I'm not finding it anywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's the bonkers great dumpling war of Bavaria. That's... <laughs> You have this knack of finding the weirdest <laughs> shit to talk about, and it's phenomenal. So you just, Shot a fucking helicopter with a potato, uh, not yeah. a potato gun, Jesus. Well, I mean, he said he didn't want to be a weapon war. Technically, he was, could have been one, even because he's using a crossbow slash catapult ballista, or ballista, whatever you want to call it, because right. they all look the same, they all do the same thing. But anyway, so we'll be like, no, they, this one does this. No, they're all the shoot shit. <laughs> Right. They're all old timey things that shoot right. stuff. But yeah. That's He died in two thousand thirteen, mm-hmm. so it was fairly recent when he yeah. well, ten years ago. Uh, like one of the pictures that I uh, could find of him that we'll be posting is like him show, holding like a little golden version of his crossbow. Oh my goodness. Kind of pole thing that he would shoot. But <clears throat> so, yeah. I mean I get it. Like being the the grumpy neighbor basically. Oh, yeah. Like I, I get it. Oh yeah, so do I. But I mean, he took it to an extreme, but mm-hmm. I mean that—that that, to me, that's funny. Yeah, 
Just wait until I have the World War II story that I, I'm saving for probably the episode before Memorial Day. Oh, God. Don't tell me nothing about it. <laughs> not, well, e- not even a little bit. I don't, I don't want to hear nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and I know you because you'll leak a little bit. And, and then I'll draw, be drawn in. So, no, just yeah, keep, all right. keep your lips together. It's something I had heard about before, but since I was playing Company Heroes, it's something that just popped in my head while I was playing. Because mm. an object that I seen in the, in the, you know, he uses cover in the game, I just, I remembered it being a thing, and I still found it a little bit ridiculous. Oh. That they were doing this as a morale thing. Okay. Well, but we're not, we're done talking about it. But anyway, it. I'm going to stop right there before I continue on. Because you do that. I'll start dropping stuff. Right. Like I just did there again. Right. Stop. Uh. <laughs> God damn. You just don't know when to stop. Yeah, sometimes I do. Mm. But anyhow. I think it's time we close the Emporium up for the day, Sarah. What do you think? I agree. Until next time. Remember to creep it real? Did you fucking hear it too? Yeah. It sounded like one of the cats. No, they are like a whistling. Yeah, I heard it. Please check out our website at macabreemporiumpodcast.com. Join our Facebook group by searching Macabre Emporium. Like and subscribe on YouTube at Macabre Emporium Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Macabre Emporium. And if you have any stories of the paranormal, your local true crime, or weird history that you would want us to look into and possibly do an episode on, email us at macabreemporiumpod at gmail.com. Remember to follow, rate, like, review, and share whenever and wherever you can and help us grow our little baby podcast.